Hi there! Finally, after five videos, we'll be able to talk about sound synthesis itself. I'm going to start about the analog synthesis, then we're going to move on to digital, then I'm going to talk about how do you do all that in software using a microcontroller, and finally, how to implement that in the ESP32. Cue the intro! So, first of all, how to actually synthesize sound. So I'm gonna go back in time, analog systems, what are the basic techniques to generate sound, right? So let's just jump to Wikipedia and find the keywords and the basic concepts. So last time people complained about I did not highlight something, so I use Windows to make my mouse pointer gigantic. And although it, you can see there, it bugs a little bit, but still you can see where my mouse is. And I'm using some zoom here so you can show you the text properly. And the main techniques you're gonna find about sound synthesis, they are additive, you add waves, subtractive, you're gonna filter waves, then you have frequency modulation, very important technique, and finally, techniques that use memory. So let's just briefly discuss all these four methods and then you can jump to digital synthesis, right? So, additive synthesis, how does it work? Well, I'm gonna skip all the Wikipedia part. I'm gonna show you that it's way easier than you think. You're basically summing waves to get your final output, a more complex wave. That's it, it's just summing values. So remember we already showed you this script. I used this in a previous video about how actually additive synthesis work and harmonics and all that. You can check previous videos and you can also check GitHub. Then you can find my several assignments on this work about sound synthesis and maybe help you out. But it's basically about how do you sum harmonics to generate waves. You can actually sum any wave to generate a new wave, but summing harmonics is the most popular method. And here you can see that you have a big sum there and the more elements you sum from the harmonics, the closer you get to the desired waveform, right? So let me just get rid of all this and then show you using the sawtooth how can you actually sum waves to form a new wave in a very simple way, right? Let's just get rid of this. So what did I just do here? Uh, I created this function. You have two inputs, X and N. Basically X you're gonna use to scan the wave and we use this form and n will be which harmonic of the main frequency we want. So I create a list, one, two, three, four, five. One, of course, is the fundamental wave, and you can see them here. I created a, a small offset so you can visualize it better. And basically, you have these waves and higher and higher frequency, but smaller and smaller amplitudes. And that's basically how you use harmonics and how you find harmonics in nature. But what happens if I start adding them up? Well, I will show you them manually here instead of using a sum that does not show you the process. So basically I start summing these waves, right? And I can just turn them off. And you start the fundamental, then I will sum the first harmonic. You can see it's already going towards the sawtooth, right? And then I sum the second harmonic and the third. The more you sum harmonics, the closer you get to the desired waveform. Of course, either I have an inverted version, but if I just change this, you can see that's where we're going towards, right? Like when you have the fourth harmonic and the fundamental, that's what you got on our small script. And that's basically it. You sum waveforms to generate your desired waveform, additive synthesis. And that's the joke on this playlist, uh, addictive synthesis. So subtractive synthesis is not quite the opposite because you're not using, generally not using simple waveforms, you're using more complex and rich waveforms. How does that work? Well, you're gonna generate a complex waveform. Sometimes you can use noise or uh, already recorded sample waveform, but basically you're gonna generate it and then you're gonna pass through one or more filters. And the filters can be all kinds of filters, low pass, high pass, the article on Wikipedia is actually super useful and uses the human example, which is the best example about subtractive synthesis. I'm not planning on using subtractive synthesis, but 
maybe when the synthesizer is almost done I can actually implement it but for now I'm gonna focus on additive and sampling so let's just talk about frequency modulation before going to sampling huh frequency modulation is basically a dynamic change on the frequency you generate by your oscillator so you have basically an oscillator connected to another oscillator and by that you modulate its frequency just like you use on FM radio just like subjective synthesis Frequency modulation is not my main goal on my project on the synthesizer. Although, if I manage to finish my project on time, maybe I'll try to implement it as well, because this would be basically... You have a parallel oscillator controlling the frequency of the main oscillator, and that's easy to implement. I already tested, and it works for, of course, low frequencies, right? Typical FM, you can actually use some higher frequencies to modulate the main carrier so if i actually manage to pull it off and implement frequency modulation i'll make a video about it but at least for now i'll just focus on additive and wavetable or sampling they are not the same thing and i'll explain it. let's just take a look at that so you can see as i highlighted there wavetable is not the same as sample based synthesis and the main difference is the sample based, you record a sound, or at least you generate it, doesn't matter. You have a pre recorded sound, and you're gonna run through it and loop or go back and forth this sample. And the sample can be milliseconds long or seconds long, doesn't matter. Wavetable synthesis uses a form of memory, but you can change dynamically each and every value on a wavetable. And this wave though contains, by definition, one period of the wave, not many seconds or milliseconds. You have exactly a period of the wave and you can draw, you can custom the shape of your waveform and then you use a wavetable. Although it just sounds the same from a controller perspective, the technique is very different. So I recommend you to read this article in Wikipedia. It's very useful to have a look about the lookup table and how to use an index and have an output value. This will be used in a DDS system. So this is basically all we need to, to know to implement DDS system in our microcontroller. Before going to digital, let's just take a quick look out of curiosity on sample based synthesis. So as I told you, sample based is basically you're gonna get a pre-recorded audio and then loop or go back and forth. You can modulate the sample and generate new sounds this is super used uh, until this very day and you have special instruments that read different samples depending on which key you press from a software point of view sample based and wavetable they just can be implemented using the same architecture so after implementing the architecture which is the hardest part you can just choose what to do with the resources so that of course was a very quick very basic rundown of the basic methods you have you can use to generate sound synthesis but that was all based on analog systems or mixed systems how can you do all that in direct digital synthesis well here is direct digital synthesis how to generate arbitrary waveforms using a digital system and again wikipedia to save the day you have here a block diagram of a basic dds system and this might look confusing, but I tried to explain this. I already explained this in another video, but just, just you know, another quick rundown so you can get up to speed. And then I can show you the software version, the software implementation of a DDS that is usually implemented in hardware. So as you can see, these three main blocks here all have the same reference oscillator because this is a digital system. It has the same clock to keep everything synchronized. This is not a feedback loop. And in the end, you have a reconstruction low pass filter. I will explain everything here. Let's just go to the beginning to explain the first element, a frequency control register. Well, to understand the frequency control register, you have to remember vectors. And what is a vector? Well, basically you have this variable, this memory that has an index and for each index, a value. And that's basically what a numerically controlled oscillator is. It oscillates but is controlled by a number. In our case here, you input an index and it outputs the digital value. The frequency control register is basically the counter. It's the counter that sets 
which position of our table you want to use in the output. So it's basically the index of our vector and how much we add in this calendar is up to us and up to the frequency you want to use in the outputs. And then you have a digital to analog converter, which basically translates the digital value to an analog value so you can put in a amplifier, preamplifier, output, it depends on your system. And in the end, you have a reconstruction low-pass filter. Why do you need the reconstruction low-pass filter? Well, let's go back to Desmos and I'm going to show you a script I made to show you what happens when you use a DAC on a wavetable. So, if you guys watched my playlist, you're already familiarized with this script. I just move it up a bit. There you go. In purple, you have the original wave I want to construct. In black, you have the digital output of my DAC. And in red, you have the error. So there are two ways to actually minimize this error. You can increase the sample rate or you can increase the bit depth right here. And here is the output. This is the output, the digital output of our system. So what happens here? Let's just use a really big sample rate. So we do not care about sample rate. Let's just focus on bits. And of course, if you use an infinite number of bits and an infinite sample rate, you get a number in which the error would tend to be zero. But of course, that is impossible to make. We need a finite clock and you have finite memory and finite processing power. So what happens is, depending on our frequency and bit depth, you have these steps in the output. Of course, I'm going to be using something between 16 and 32 bits for a DAC, so it's a lot. But it doesn't matter what bit depth you use or sample rate, you always have an error. So how do you get rid of this high frequency repo that's, of course, a product of our sampling? Well, you pass it through a filter. The filter is also there to act as an anti-aliasing filter. If you want to know more about aliasing, you can search it up on Wikipedia or Sampling Theorem by Nyquist Shannon. And I already talked about that in this playlist, so I'm going to move on and go back to DDS. So, now you know everything you need, at least the basics, to construct your own hardware DDS. But how can you make this all in software? Well, this is actually super simple. As a frequency control register right here, you need a counter. And this counter will count up, of course, with a fixed number every time you increment it. If you want to vary its frequency, you're going to change the value in which the counter is incremented. And that's basically it. Of course, as our numerically controlled oscillator or our lookup table is finite, Every time this number exceeds the limit of our vector, of our lookup table, you need to decrement the size of the lookup table from this counter. So in the example, we have a vector with 100 positions and you're counting one. And you have one, two, three, four, five, six. Remember, it can be a float. It can be every kind of counting, not just integer. But anyway, when you go into 100, you went to zero to 99, you have to subtract it so you can go back to the vector and keep on counting. The DAC part and the reconstruction low pass filter is basically the output after you have this interrupt routine running on my controller. And of course, they're all synchronous because all the three main parts are running inside our interrupt routine. The DAC I chose has a built in reconstruction low pass filter, so anti aliasing and getting rid of the pesky harmonics that will probably generate some sound anomalies and as the DAC has a built-in filter we don't have to get worried about that. So everything you need to do is to write the DAC and then finish the interrupt routine and wait for the next interrupt to occur. So how do you implement that on an ESP32, huh? Well, let's check that out. Before showing you the code, let just a quick reminder of the basic elements we have on a synthesizer. So first we have oscillators and you already saw how the oscillators work. Analog, digital and software version. Then we have filters. Well, digital filters are kind of complex topic, but in a software there'll be a sequence of summing and dividing 
it's simple to implement, it's not that simple to actually get the coefficients. Then you have the envelopes. Envelopes are usually generated by a amplifier that has the gain controllable. So you can multiply by a very number and this amplifier you just draw these envelopes. And you can see right here the classic one ADSR. And after the envelopes the next thing you have that as a basic element is a low frequency oscillator. Basically an oscillator that you use to control your gain on your filter. And these variable gain amplifiers and the low frequency oscillators, they can be implemented with a really low frequency sample rate because the effects that they are applying to the array are actually really slow. So what you really need to keep in mind is we don't need our 44 kilohertz sample rate or entire core to use for the envelopes and low frequency oscillators. So what are you going to do? So we're going to implement all these different timings using software timers in our code. You may remember the code I posted on the video about how to use the two cores on the ESP32. Well, timer 0 is going to implement an interruption on core 0 and timer 1 on core 1. But we don't need two cores to implement the envelopes and low frequency oscillators and our actual output. What can we do? So keep in mind, this is the prototype software I use to actually evaluate the functionalities of my codes to actually deliver the first part of my bachelor's work. Now I have until the end of the next semester, about May 2022. Yeah, I believe that's the date, May or June, to end the definitive version. So this was just a placeholder to evaluate if I could actually make it work and I actually made it. So what is happening here? I have two tasks running each core, but I could use a really sophisticated task to run super fast at the sample rate of my wave. And a second task with a really slow interrupt rate, like one kilohertz. And with that slow rate, you could actually manage the low frequency oscillators and you can manage the envelope for the gains. And the super fast sample rate, you actually generate our output. Task one is basically blinking an LED just to show that it, the second core is actually in use. And this is a DS system. And of course, with some extra things that you actually don't need to care about. This was a reverb prototype that was developing. What we need is here. Let me just make this bigger for you to see. So Bob1 and Bob2 are the names of my vectors. They are the two lookup tables I have in here and I generated them with another code because it's just to generate a vector. So you can use a software in C, Python, whatever you want and I generate these huge texts that save each value on my lookup table. And after that, you have the increments and counters and all that. But you can just forget everything here I'm going to show you the only thing that matters. Remember in the DDS, you have a clock that synchronizes all the diagram blocks, right? So, which part in this code is the clock, the source clock? Is this. Our task 0 will only run in a finite determined frequency, which is, by the way, the sample rate. So, that's the clock that synchronizes all the operations. You calculate all the lookup tables, sum them all, and then write in the DAC. So you have all those blocks in one code. Remember, I cannot use float in the interrupt cycle on the ESP32. Why is that? I don't know, but that's how the ESP32 works. So how can you circumvent this small issue? Well, I don't want to use a float or a double anyway, because you make a processing super slow in the SP32. It's not a very powerful core compared to an STM32H7, for example. So what do I do? When I set the step, which I want to add to my counter every cycle, I multiply it by a thousand. And then when I'm going to use it, I divide it by a thousand. And that is a pseudo float you can use on a code. But multiplying and dividing is actually costly on the processor. So you use shift left and right and I use here 10 you can see we 
because that's close to a thousand is a thousand and twenty four. How do I pull it off? Well, basically I have the counter which tells me which position I am in the lookup table and I load that into a local variable so it's quicker for the processor. Although I tested and the difference is negligible. After that, I increment the position on my lookup table by the increment associated with my voice. As you can see here, this is a for loop to use on many voices. If my voice exceeds the size of my vector, then I subtract the size of the set vector. So every time I run off the limit of the vector, I go back as if the vector is infinite to both sides, right? And after that, I load the value in my lookup table from the now updated position, the updated index. And here I multiply by a volume that is controlled externally. Then I update my counter. Instead of using the counter with an index every single time, that saves a little bit of processing power. And in the end, of course, I load into my DAC that, of course, is using I square S, the left and the right channel. This code can be a little bit daunting for you if you never programmed or if you're a beginner, but just, just keep in mind the, the main important thing is you have a position in a vector, you increment that position, you load the new value into your DAC. Here I have multiple voices, I have multiple channels that will be loaded after in your left and right channel. So what I do is I run a for loop because I need to update all those voices. If you have a single voice, a single channel, going to your output, you don't need a for loop, you just run this once. But I'm running a lot of voices. In this case here, 61 voices. A single voice for each key pressed in the keyboard. And this actually worked, I test already. So we can, with the power of the ESP32 core, run 61 voices. We can actually go actually beyond 61 voices but remember after all those basic blocks we used on the dds you can use extra blocks between the basic core and the dac you can apply effects filter reverb echo wah wah whatever it's important to remember this is just a basic block to run from a lookup table to an output if you want to put effects on your voice you need extra steps in our task in here, I tried a prototype reverb effect, it didn't work quite well, but use processing power. So I want to simulate if there'll be a huge impact on my processing timings. And it just worked fine because in the end, it's just a little bit of summing and dividing and super fast. So here we can control the volume of our voice from outside the loop. And then you can use ADSR envelopes, for example. How gonna do that? Well, we have this interruption here, uh, 44, or 40 or 100 kilohertz, right? Outside that, you have this variable here that you write outside this loop, and when this loop happens, the interrupt cycle starts, you read that volume and multiply it. And this ADSR envelope can be done with much slower sample rates. I'm using here one kilohertz for the second task, because of course it's a prototype code, but in the final code, I use the same core that used for the peripherals and all that, I use to apply the ADSR and low frequency oscillators. So basically the most important task is this one running at your sample rate and all the other less important things can run on a very, very slow interrupt cycle. So here I have asynchronous functions that will run outside the interrupt cycle and they will, of course, control the pitch. Of course, I call pitch mid because uh, internal joke. And you can add voice, remove voice. You can change the frequency. And of course, you can change the volume, which this voice is applied to the output by changing the volume variable of said voice. And that's basically the code version of a simple DDS system. I will run through this code in way more detail when it comes to the implementation part. This is just a demonstration to you to show that from the analog techniques, we can go to digital techniques. And from the digital techniques, you can go to the software techniques. And now you, you understand the basics of additive, subtractive, and frequency modulation, and sample of waveable synthesis. Because in the end, you're running a lookup table, you're running along this vector, reading values, and applying to the output. 
and in the future if everything goes accordingly I will apply effects and filters and whatnot. So the theory is the same. For additive I use extra voices and sum them together. For subtractive I use filtering which is effect just my reverb that happens before you apply the final value to the output. If you're gonna use frequency modulation you're gonna use this function here that changes the pitch every a thousand hertz for example and then you can modulate this voice I already made it work and I can show that in a future episode when I actually implement in hardware and I have a oscilloscope to show everything and you can use wavetable and sampling just because that's the main part of a DDS there's no way you can run a DDS without a lookup table without a vector and that just makes wavetable or sample inevitable of course, you don't need, like I did here, a wavetable of a single period to use wavetable synthesis. You can have a way much longer sample and go for sample synthesis. And I'm planning on doing that once I have the basic architecture actually implemented in my ESP, in the final prototype. I will start the works on the final prototype this month, next week to be very precise. I'm recording this in December 1st. Then I will solder everything to a board and then I have the final architecture, the final design. And then I actually show you every single technique, additive and frequency modulation and all that. And implement that using a oscilloscope to demonstrate the workings, the internal workings of the software. This video is just to show you the basics of DDS and to explain the basic stuff you need to know to implement audio using a microcontroller. So I know my videos are kind of messy, I don't follow a decent script, but I hope you understood the basics of a DDS and analog and digital synthesis, because these are the basic pillars in which upon you're gonna build our synthesizer. So we need to know the basics of digital synthesis. And at least to me, the easiest way is to learn how we did that in analog circuits and then just transpose that knowledge to the digital universe, you know? I hope you liked this now sixth video of additive synthesis, my playlist that is basically a vlog of the development of my bachelor's work. If you have any questions, please post them down below. If you want to criticize me in any way, at least use a good argument, just don't slam me, right? Be polite. If you have any questions, seriously, ask them down below. It will be more than a pleasure to actually try to enlighten you a little bit and if I made a mistake please comment also I'm here to teach but also to learn and now that I have this final chapter about tutorials and the how to's you can jump right into building the synthesizer and you go back to the first episode about cleaning and fixing the keyboard because I redo everything I showed in the video because the keyboard is right there for a long time so I'm gonna clean it all over again test if my circuit is still working, everything is fine, and then decide on the final design of my synthesizer, and I'm gonna solder everything, and just after that is the softer part is gonna matter. So I think the last step that I needed to tell you as the intro is how to run a DAC using the SP32. So if you have any doubts about using the PCM5102A using an SP32 or any microcontroller, I will show you how in the next video. I really hope you liked this video, you learned something, and until the next video, be safe!